Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to welcome to the stage panel moderator Shireen Marisol Maraji, host of NPR's Code Switch, and panelists Lisa Mae Brunson, Danielle Carrig, Patricia Green, and Judith Williams. not to dance to that music. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm Shreem Marisol Maraji. I host a podcast at NPR. We talk about race and identity in America. It's called Code Switch. You can download it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. OK, that's, that's the plug. <laughs> For the next half hour, though, it's all about these four amazing women, and they're going to talk about where things stand right now with women in the workforce from their vantage points. Um, and then we're going to have some action items that they're going to share with you all or advice that you're going to take away with you and implement as soon as tomorrow, if you want to. And we're going to open things up for questions. So that's how things are going to roll. We have about a half an hour, no pressure. <laughs> Yes. Judith, we're going to start with you. Judith is way down there. Uh, Judith, yes, everyone give Judith a round of applause, but not too long because we only have a half hour. <laughs> All right. So Judith, you've done a ton of work on diversity in Silicon Valley. You've worked with tech goliaths. I'm going to say Google to name drop one of them. Um, talk about what it looks like for women in tech in 2018. I know that's a huge topic, but break that down for us. Yeah, uh, so you saw the statistics, which is over the past 10 years, the representation of women in high-tech jobs has actually dropped 2%. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, it starts with the hiring, which is that we aren't seeing as many women go into computer science. But still, about 25% of computer science grads are, are, are graduating, so we're not getting all of them. And part of that has to do with this idea of culture fit. And if you have a lot of dudes, and they form a company, and then they hire their friends, who hire their friends, who hire their friends, and then they wake up, there are 100 people, and they're like, oh, wait, should we hire a woman? <laughs> it's really hard to be that first woman on a technical team, and especially a woman who has already probably faced a lot of those microaggressions that happen in homosocial groups, especially when men are really used to being men together. Uh, so a technical woman will often enter a team where she is one of the only women, or maybe there's one other woman, uh, and she's subject to a lot of sometimes unwarranted attention, uh, really aggressive folks who will ask her out, uh, and then evaluate her code on whether or not they like their response to her going out. Now that's not every woman's case, but those are some of the things that will happen to women. Uh, so there's some big culture issues. Uh, and then there also are some unfriendly policies toward women. If you're thinking about what type of maternity benefits, what type of flexible working arrangements, there are a lot of challenges. And for a lot of these organizations, because they grew up really scrappy and opposed to traditional HR, they don't put in those policies until very late. So it creates a kind of environment that can be very comfortable. So part of the problem is that women aren't entering. Another piece of the problem is that their treatment can be really uh, unpleasant when they get there. And then the third piece is that they leave. So they don't advance to those senior levels where they have the influence to really make change. Can you talk specifically about women of color now? And <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> So, so that's, um, Emerald mentioned the double bind. Yes. And for women of color, it's even more severe because there are stereotypes around gender, but there are also stereotypes around race. And then when you, when you think about this idea of, you know, we talk about a unicorn in tech. Um, we, if you, being a woman of color in tech, as for example, a software engineer, it's really like being a purple unicorn. And 
everybody says they want to hire you, but then they don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And so they, they deal with stereotypes not only with race, but also with gender. So it makes it really hard for them to be successful and talk about being the only one like you in your group. So you find yourself uh, among women, they might not empathize with what's, what it's like to be a person of color, and among men uh, of color, they're like, they don't understand the gender. So it's doubly challenging, and they're even more rare. And I, I mean, I can remember at Google, you know, and, and Google now has about 70,000 employees, when we had a total of two black female software engineers, uh. two. Lisa May, you're trying to address this with the work you're doing with Wonder Women Tech, these inequities that Judith is talking about. Um, can you talk about an initiative that you have going on that, that will address this, this problem with diversity in tech? Yeah, so talking about being a woman of color, try being a woman of color launching a tech conference. It's been a really interesting journey. Um, so in addition to creating a platform where women and people of color, people that identify as underrepresented, um, can discuss these issues, um, we're in London, Long Beach, and Washington, D.C., so we created that platform. And through this work across four years, we've understood that there's clearly a challenge. And we wanted to create a new initiative called Hiring, Hiring Humans, which we just launched last month with Amazon as our first guinea pig. Um, so we presented a workshop for 200 recruiters, and it was very interesting uh, opportunity for us to learn just how much we have not uh, grown within the industry. I've always said that we're not trying to push the needle forward because that's incremental change, and we're going to take 250 years to get there, right? So we want 270, to 270, I think, or 270. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Um, so it's, it's really about proposing radical change and creating a different kind of corporate culture. So we're inspiring companies to think differently, not only about how they're hiring humans, but how are they going to keep them happy and how are they going to be inclusive and create a culture that's truly um, dynamic and allows people to excel and to grow. Danielle. You're here repping the entertainment industry, the entire entertainment industry. No pressure. All of LA, all of LA, all of Hollywood. Uh, you're at Netflix right now, yes. but you spent years yes. working at Lifetime. Yes. And for me, I, the question is kind of obvious. It's hashtag me too, hashtag times up, hashtag uh, inclusion writer, yeah. I believe it is. Yeah. You know, Love is Francis. any of that resulting in concrete, lasting change. Yeah. I know it's early. Uh, you but. know, um, I'm, the, I'm the biggest cynic in the room, maybe, right? Uh, but it is. I, I, I'm amazed to come here and say things are changing, not just conversation, but actual, you know, what I love about this in the report that um, it, we're talking about today is numbers are a source of truth. And when you have numbers and you have current research, Stacey Smith, probably a lot of us know, she's doing this research with Gina, funding it, and the Gina, Gina Davis Foundation. Without these numbers that we're tracking, we don't know what's happening. But when we do have these numbers, we see slow shifts in Hollywood happening um, over the course of you know many years. But um, I'll share a story with you. I was somehow lucky enough to be on the inside in one of the, fir uh, one of the first meetings um, at CAA about Time's Up, before Time's Up was announced. Mm -hmm. And I remember kind of, by the way, they didn't call it Time's Up. They were just like, you're invited to this meeting at CAA. Um, an agent friend invited me on a Sunday. And I got this random email, can you come, Danielle? We're gonna be talking about women, women, women. I'm like, okay, I'm done talking about women. We're talking about all the time. You know, what are we really gonna do? It's my Sunday. You're saying I have to show up at 8 a.m. on the other side of town on a Sunday. And so I emailed my friend, I'm like, well, I think I can, you know how we do in LA. I'm like, eh, I think I can come for a couple hours. And then I was gonna have my quick exit, like dip in, see what was gonna happen. So little old me shows up and all of a sudden, here's Reese Witherspoon, here's America Ferrara, here's Donna Langley, here's Jill Soloway, Shonda Rhimes, all of these major, major voices um, collectively coming together cross agency, so CAA, William Morris, this network, that network, this studio, they spent their entire Sunday together um, doing this. And of course I didn't leave. I'm like, shit, if <laughs> Reese Witherspoon is, you know, if she's sitting here, you know, uh, Natalie Portman, 
Um, uh, I was floored, and from the very moment that meeting started, um, uh, Gloria Steinem was calling in because she couldn't get on a plane, and Tina Chen flew in from Chicago. I mean, women traveled from around the country to be there that day. And yeah, so it's, it's serious, and I thought, oh, something's happening, something's happening here. Uh, you know, kind of on us that it took this moment, right? Like real serious sexual aggressions to come to light and women having to be raw and share those stories publicly, the stories we all know. Um, I would say I was even surprised on the inside of an entertainment um, company. For me, when I started hearing the Harvey Weinstein things come out, um, maybe like many of you in the room, I said, oh yeah, we all know that. Like, oh, it's worse than I thought, but we kind of all knew that and thank goodness somebody's taking care of it and it's being addressed and he's, he's gonna be in trouble, right? What I was so um, enamored with is the young women I'm around. You know, Netflix is a pretty young workforce and the young women coming to me and saying, hold on a second, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us as a company, us as an industry? I want to talk about this and I want to be heard and I want other people to hear me. And that was different too, mm -hmm. right? Um, that was very, very different than I think the workforce of 10 years ago. And so because it was rising up, um, we did have forums and discussions and you know, held our executives to align. What are we doing? What are you doing? And um, so I think you know, that's a very kind of general um, picture of the ethos and the environment. But then I do, I do expect it to affect these numbers of women who are directing projects, women on crews. Um, but what we need, as I look to a lot of the young women in, in the audience today, is we need the pipeline, right? Um, and that's the big issue, um, is, is, is women who want to work um, in that way in Hollywood and to, and to sign up and raise their hand. So I'll stop there. Patricia, you are here representing the federal government. <laughs> no pressure. The weight of the world. <laughs> this federal government. <laughs> you head up the Women's Bureau at the U.S. Department of Labor. I do. And I want to know, for you, what is the number one issue that, we, that the federal government needs to tackle? Is it child care for women? Is it... Uh, the uh, pay inequity between men and women, what is it? I like that question because I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the reason is that it goes back to what Dr. Archer said about needing the infrastructure. So at the Women's Bureau, we're 98 years old. For 98 years, we've been advocating for women in the workforce. We're really the chief advocate for women in the United States workforce. Now, for the last few, I've only been there five months, so, you know, just <laughs> working on it now. But what we've done over the last few months is really dug into all the research as well as all our experiences. And we've identified 15 different factors that have the potential to influence a woman's experience in the pipeline, her experiences while she's in the workforce, uh, the rewards she takes away from the workforce. And the challenge is, and this is my number one that I think the government needs to work on, is to recognize that they're all connected. It's kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. You know, you stick it in one place and it pops out someplace else. <laughs> so, um, I mean, childcare, of course, you can't go to school if you have children and have nowhere to put them. You can't go to work. You can't go to work if you don't have a, um, a prescribed schedule. You know, you want to make the same pay for one the time that you work. You certainly want to be in a safe environment. You want to be able in any kind of occupation that you can possibly be in. And I can go right down all 15 and basically take one and wrangle it through all the other 14. So I think the number one thing we need to do is recognize it's a holistic system. It's all based, primarily, I'll say all based on power, and a lot of that power comes down to economic equality. So if I were going to really kind of aggregate it down to one thing, it would be how do we all work together about economic equality? Now the other piece of that is we're not just corporate women. You know, even the policies that are often passed are only for women in larger companies. What about everybody else? Yeah. Rural women, young women, formerly incarcerated women. Yeah. We also have a list of demographics to say that women doesn't mean all one thing. 
So how do we not only address this as a holistic system, but a holistic system that works for everybody? Yeah, and finally, my husband and I have three sons, one of whom is here today. Oh. You know, and we Hello. Have, hey, and we have three granddaughters. I mean, I want, to work, I want a workplace that works for everybody. So how do we really wrangle all that into our holistic system? Yeah. I do want to I, open this up and have it be more of an organic discussion now. So if there's anything um, anyone up here on this panel heard from somebody else who said something and you, you, you thought of something and want to chime in, I would love to hear from you. If not, I can keep giving you questions. Well, I think what you're saying, money and power go hand in hand and the flow of capital. And us as women, I think, need to watch that and, and be hungry for it and be okay with being hungry for that and talking about money. Agentic. And, and yes, yes. And, um, you know, being unapologetic about following the flow of capital. And so when, a, you know, when I see the statistics of this report and the 4% CEO thing, to me, that's, you know, if that, that's the lowest percentage on that bar, just draw that line, huge problem, huge problem, because we're talking about wealth inequality in a big scale, I think. I think we also, I mean, I, I think it is important for us to recognize that women can be more agentic, but I, I hate when we fall into the let's fix the women kind of yeah. solution, because we also need to fix the structures, so. That's actually some language we're starting to use, too. I mean, if you think about it, our labor force model is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. You know, it really doesn't work anymore. So you're right, instead of cramming women into these old models, change the model, change the dialogue. One of, one of the most striking things, it's exactly right, of the report, when I was reading and highlighting and thinking about the words, um, there was an assumption made in the report that said, you know, we all know the daily stresses of working for women, right? We are our work, right? Or our system and our society, how stressful it is. And if you take a step back, I'm wondering, and if we had more women, why? Why, is it, why does it have to be so stressful? Why are we killing ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's when, we, when I think of old models of, you know, trying to figure it all out and having to, you know, again, bar chart, how stressed are you? Um, that's really sad and depressing, um, and, and I would hope that, again, as, as we all, you know, I don't know, more innovative people or women, I'll put it on women because I want to do it. I want to figure out better systems of working for women so we're not all so stressed out. Yeah. And so I, and I think it's been pretty interesting because across the four years that Wonder Women Tech has evolved, the conversations have evolved. And so recently in our Washington, D.C. summit, we had a woman who wanted to talk about the Me Too movement. And uh, basically, for the first time in three years, she wanted to use our platform to uh, share her experience with a well-known, I won't say his name because it's still in litigation, a multi-billionaire tech CEO who had sexually harassed her and her, her entire life has been ruined for three years. She's on welfare. She was crying. She had not spoken out publicly. And she was actually linked to me through a Forbes uh, journalist. But it was interesting because my team looked at me and said, are we doing this? Are we gonna, like, we're supposed to be a tech conference. But we've seen the conversations that people wanna have evolve as the, as the nation, national conversations and global conversations have changed. So I said, of course we're doing this because if it affects women, if it affect, affects the underrepresented, we need to be there for them. So it's, it's been really an interesting journey too. I think that, especially talking about the international piece of reaching out more, um, these last few weeks is the Commission of Status of Women is meeting at the UN. So I was able to be there last year, and a lot of the talk was about the future of work. And it was driven by technology. The conversation, the panel was almost all about technology. But going back to think about what else, because it's not just about technology. It's really thinking about the integration of the rest of our lives into how we choose to work and sort of, get, I'm, I'm big on language today, getting rid of the shoulds and working for the coulds, as long as the opportunities are there, we get to decide on what we want to do with those. Yeah. And when we, when we change the world for women, we change it for everyone, right? Well, there's a lot of evidence you know, that, that says that when you add women, I can think about a Python meetup that a woman started in the Bay Area, and she said she just wanted to have another coder in the room with her. 
But what ended up happening was as there were more women in these meetups in the open source community, men came to her and said, wow, you've actually made the culture better for us too. And so by having these new models, by having more women in the conversation, that's how we make change. And especially at those higher levels, as you were saying, it's, it is that completely integrated type of view that's gonna help us. Judith, you said it's not all on the women to do this, right? You work in Silicon Valley where many of the levers of power are held by men or pushed by men, however you would say that. Um, so how do you get men to get on board with blowing up this system that <laughs> benefits them in every way? Yeah, that's hard. Um, <laughs> so so par part of it is you have to invite men into the conversation. And so I like to start the conversations by saying, tech has a diversity problem. White men, you are not the problem, right? But we do have a diversity problem. And there are all sorts of opportunities that are missed when we don't have people from different backgrounds in the room. And if we don't have women in the room, the type of technology that we are inventing is a technology that's not thinking about, about what women need. And I, I think about it, Google, you know, Google has tried unsuccessfully to build a shopping app. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I think they've been unsuccessful at really building an effective shopping app is because it's all dudes. Thinking about shopping is purely transactional, <laughs> right? And, and you're all laughing, because I know, I shop when I'm happy, I shop when I'm sad, I shop when I'm bored, I shop with friends, I shop alone. It's recreational for me, right? It's a very different experience. We would have very different types of apps, types of technology, if we had women in the room. A another example, and speaking of shopping and your love of shopping, um, please talk about your shoes and how your shoes actually illustrate why this is important. So I'm gonna She's wearing up. Louboutins, Can everyone. Can you see my shoes? So I, so I do have this innate love of shoes, and uh, I'm going to ask, can anyone tell me, and just scream this out, what color are my shoes? They are flesh-colored shoes, right? And why they're flesh-colored shoes is they are the same color as my flesh, right? Or they are nude shoes. And so for a long time, nude shoes were always beige. Right? They weren't brown like my legs. And Christian Louboutin had someone on his team who said, beige is not the color of my legs. And so he started a line of shoes. There are now seven colors. So women like me and of all shades can have nude or flesh colored shoes. Because um, one person on the team was like, hey. Right, <laughs> one person on the team. And the coda is they're always sold out. I went to London to buy these. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna get those when I'm in London in June. That's amazing. <laughs> all right, our time is running out, which is such a bummer because I 30 minutes is not enough. I could talk to you all for 3 hours. Um, we're going to we're going to wrap up with some action items here and Danielle, I want to start with you actually. Something that you're really really passionate about is um, making sure that women who are in leadership roles support other women. And <laughs> I'm just going to let you tell a story that illustrates how to do that. There's so many. There's so many. <laughs> I, I would say when, when we were talking about the double bind, the gender double bind, I'll share this story because it's vulnerable, but I bet I'm not the only one. And I, I think it's important so we collectively kind of have our strength together. But um, in the past 18 months, I would say that I've been called, I've, I've had sharp elbows, um, that I'm, I just want to take over the world. And yet on the other side, I'm too polished. So I have sharp elbows but I'm too polished. And um, I think, you know, I call it like the Hillary effect, you know? Um, you get so many contradictory points of view, you just don't even know how to navigate the, the, the very dense landscape of, of corporate America sometimes. Um, it's very, very difficult for, for um, all of us. And, um, but I would say, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to see that unique, it's a unique challenge, it's okay to call it out, it's, it's different for women, right? We're, we're encountering different things that are challenging us and we finally have this data to support it. Um, but what if we, the women who got, they, they navigated the, the minefield and they got to these positions of power somehow, some way, by playing by the rules, right? Kind of playing by the old rules. My, my goal is that by the time we get there, we have to then break those rules to open up yes. the doors a little wider. Um, and so a quick story is that um, when we talk about women directors and why there are so few, 
Um, you know, uh, what, what do, wh how, how do we change, how do we change it? It's very complex. One thing a colleague of mine was doing is that um, she recognized that women directors, they don't take the big jobs when they have to go to Toronto and shoot for three months, when they have to go to Romania and shoot for three months, because they want to be, they, they're caretakers. They have to be home with their families. They don't want to leave their kids that long. So she started writing into the contracts, look, this is kind of unprecedented, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay for these tickets for you and, and I'm gonna go, we have to go above and beyond, right? Break the rules. Um, it's going to, you know, you're, we're gonna get you to your kids so you can have this job and build your career. And then what ended up happening was all of this criticism for doing that, right? By, by, by women executives and women leadership, right? Um, so again, um, it's hard, but you have to keep on that path and be strong in yourself and, and uh, know you're not alone, but it happens every day, these challenges. So basically, if you followed the old school rules and yeah. you made it to the top, it's time to break those time rules. To break them. Yeah. So the women that come up behind you don't have to do the same thing. I love that. Um, Patricia, if people like me want to get the attention of the federal government, <laughs> Honestly, I have no idea how, how I would do that and say, hey, this is what's important for me as a woman who's working right now. How do I get your attention at the women's division of the U.S. Department of Labor? It's not as hard as you'd think. So everybody can get my email. That's not, not oh. difficult. But we actually read the letters. I mean, when you write letters to us, we actually read and answer those letters, and we have to answer them within a certain amount of time or we get nasty grams. So, but it's not a new thing to talk about this for women, but it's personal. So going beyond, you can email us, you can call us, you can write us. We actually do follow up on those kinds of things. But know all your politicians at every level. Know them personally. Make sure they know you. Make sure they know what you're thinking. If you're seeing their aides instead of them, go in a small group and insist on seeing the actual representative or the senator. But actually make sure that they know who you are and what you're thinking. Second part of that, Mount St. Mary's a ready to run program. You know, absolutely. You know, so know your current s politicians, and if you're mm -hmm. not happy with them, run for it yourself, and we'll all, everybody will support you. Lisa May, for women who have a great idea and want to break out on their own and be entrepreneurs, what's one piece of advice that you can give them? At? So uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson said it best at my last conference. Uh, you just have to show up, so just keep going for it. No, no, don't mind the naysayers, because you will have them. Just keep going. Gumption. And this is quick. I'm so sorry. All right, Judith, actually, it could be whatever you want. I was going to do the inclusive versus the feeling included thing for women managers. Do you want to still answer that? Um, sure, I can answer okay. that. Okay, so uh, Judith has this great thing. There's a difference between inc being inclusive and having your employees feel included. And can you, can you illustrate what that means? Right, so when I, when I got to Dropbox, a woman came to me and she confided uh, that right before she went on maternity leave, her uh, team, and it was six men and then her, so seven people, they wanted to do a team building exercise. So they came to her and they said, so we're gonna go play paintball. And she said, I'm seven and a half months pregnant. I'm not gonna play paintball. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, we can play golf instead. And so that's being inclusive without her feeling included because they didn't think about the impact of what they chose. So it's always important to think about what is the impact on the other person, right? Don't just invite them to the dance. Make sure they have someone to dance with when they get there. I think that's amazing. We made it. Are we still going to take questions from the audience? Do we have time for that? Oh, we don't have time for questions from the audience. Oh, not even no one. Siento. Not even one. <laughs> it's not my fault. They only gave us a half an hour. Um, thank you all so much. Thank this you. was an amazing. Grab them in between. Ask them your questions. Thanks to everybody.